Well, hello, it's ECM. Welcome back to my channel. I'm so excited that you're here today and I just wanna mention one thing. We have a whole new sound set up here. If you wanna know what I'm using for sound, I'll link it in the box below. But after my mic crapped out in the last video, I was really keen on upgrading our sound. So we should be crisp and clear and beautiful here today. And I hope you really like it a lot. All right, I'm here today to talk about a topic that is so near and dear to my heart. It also happens to be the topic that I'm asked about the most from my leadership clients, from my corporate consulting clients, from people who follow me on social media. The question I get asked the most is about what I'm reading. So I'm here today with five books that I think every woman leader should read in the spring of 2023. This first book has changed my life. This is no overstatement on my part. I wanna make it really clear that I feel like this may possibly be the most important book that I've read in like the last 10 years. This is a book by Nedra Glover Tawab. You may follow her on Instagram. She's got an enormous following. She is a mental health professional who writes about boundaries and family relationships. The title of this book is Set Boundaries, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Yourself. The thing I love about this book is that it is a book that applies to every circumstance of our lives. It covers your relationships with your family, your relationships with your friends, your relationships with your coworkers, your relationships with your work, and most importantly, your relationship with yourself. This book is amazing and it's a really easy read. It's very simple to follow along. It's got short nuggets of chapters and I sat down to read this one night before bed and I plowed through about 200 pages in one sitting. Bonus, this is not on the list, but I will just tell you that this is here as well. There's a workbook that goes with this book that is so good. This is the Set Boundaries workbook and it takes you through a bunch of exercises, some of which are in the main book, about how to set boundaries at your work and life. So. Let me just make one thing clear to everybody who may be new to my channel, maybe you're here for the first time, and please do subscribe if you don't subscribe already. I think setting boundaries and holding them is the most important skill set that you can have as a woman leader. Why? Well, because there are a number of factors that come into the way in which we are indoctrinated as women in this culture that play out everywhere. They play out especially at our work. The idea that we have to double perform. We have to be twice as good as everybody else. If we are women of color, we may have to be five times as good as white men might have to be. The idea that we should allow our boundaries around our home lives to be overrun. We have been sold this bill of goods that we're supposed to be able to have it all, particularly if you're from my generation, Gen X. This was something that we were taught as children growing up. The idea that we can have it all necessarily would require us to have like no boundaries. <laughs> so a lot of us were raised without knowing how to set and keep boundaries. And this for me is one of the most key things that we can learn and apply right now in every aspect of our lives. So please, book number one, perhaps the most important book that I've read in the last 10 years, Nedra Tawab's book, Set Boundaries, Find Peace. Read it, read it. By the way, she's got another book coming out this spring called Drama Free that's about family relationships. I haven't read that yet, but I will tell you that I am going to be grabbing that one up as soon as it is available. Second book that every woman leader should read this spring is this wonderful book by my friend Denise Duffield Thomas. This book is called Chill and Prosper. And what it's about is the idea that for those of us who are entrepreneurs, we own our own businesses, maybe we've got something going on on the side from a day job. We need to understand what hustle culture has done to us historically and how the idea that we should always be hustling, you'll notice there's a theme here, necessarily means that we don't really have good boundaries and the constant drive of the hustle is burning so many of us out. For those of you who maybe are on an entrepreneurial journey like I am, if you've been doing this for a while, let's just say sometime prior to the last five years, you know, hustle culture has dominated women's entrepreneurship for a very long time. And the idea behind it was that you had to hustle and you had to work nonstop and it was a 24 seven thing and you had to build your brand and you had to try to dominate and you had to be out there constantly selling yourself. That is a recipe for disaster. I can't tell you how many women entrepreneurs I know right now who started out maybe when I did a dozen years ago, 10 years ago, seven years ago, who have had moments in the last three years in particular where they're like, that's it, I'm gonna wrap it up, I quit. I've even had moments like that, notwithstanding the fact that as an entrepreneur, I've had a pretty serious run of success. 
I have had moments where I'm like, I'm just so tired of doing this all the time and having to be online all the time. And between Nedra Tawab's book and Denise's book about the idea that we should be able to chill out and still prosper, I have a whole new worldview in like the last six months about what healthy entrepreneurship looks like. So highly recommend Denise Duffield's book, Chill and Prosper, to any woman leader on the entrepreneurial journey this spring. Next book. Oh my goodness. Okay. So for those of you who are on Twitter, maybe you've come here to my YouTube channel after being one of the 145,000 people who were following me on Twitter before a little implosion that shall not be named happened over there on that platform. You know that I was an enormous advocate for an account called the NAP Ministry. For those of you who are not aware, the NAP Ministry is a black woman owned and operated enterprise that has been about teaching the concept of rest. It made me conscious, and again, I, there's a theme today, it made me conscious about the way in which overwork and burnout was impacting me physically. So about nine months ago, I decided that on days where I was really burnt out, particularly as a single mother of two young children, where I am their only caregiver 24 seven, one of the things that I realized was that if I didn't take breaks for myself during the day, get up at five in the, in the morning, run through my morning routine, do my work before they're off to school, drop them off at school, work, 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 pick them up in the afternoon. If I did not just take 20 minutes or so inside that window of time to rest, I was a very different person by the end of the day. So Trisha Hersey, who happens to be the founder of the NAP ministry, wrote this incredible book that came out last fall. It's called Rest is Resistance. And it's about the idea that resting is an effort of resistance against the churn and burn of late stage capitalism, against the churn and burn of what we're told we're supposed to want. And indeed that resting, resting is a key component of changing the world that we live in. I am so big on this and I'm gonna do a video very soon on the broader topic of quiet quitting. I know this may shock people, but I am 100% in favor of quiet quitting. Some people may find that stunning that I as a leadership consultant actually think quiet quitting is a good thing, but our corporate culture right now is so extractive. It just wants to take and take and take and take and take from people. That is something that as a matter of just culture generally really needs to change. One of the ways that we change that is by pushing back against it and rest, resting, quiet quitting, concepts of not allowing overwork, not allowing unpaid labor, not allowing exploitation are fundamentally key to actually changing the way work functions as a whole in this country, in the world, in our own lives, in our career trajectories and the like. So this book, profoundly recommend it to anybody who is struggling with burnout. And I love it. I love this book. I love her work. I think that every single woman leader should be familiar with her. Next book I'm going to recommend is written by a friend of mine. Everybody who follows me elsewhere, you follow me on social media, you follow me on Instagram, you followed my podcast where I interviewed this author. You know how much I love this book. So Anand Giridharis, friend of mine, you may have seen him various places, MSNBC, CNN, all over the place, wrote this amazing book called The Persuaders, the subtitle of which is At the Front Lines of the Fight for Hearts, Minds, and Democracy. This book is about how we change people's minds, how we come together as a nation, how we come together around causes. So you may wonder, given that we're here talking about women's leadership a lot of the time, why it is that I would recommend a book that is this overt about progressive political causes. Now, for those of you who know me from elsewhere, you know that I'm a lifelong progressive. One of the things that I think is just a key skill set that we need more of right now is persuasion and finding ways to work with one another. There's some great stuff in this book. There's an interview in this book with Loretta Ross. If you don't know her, you should just go use the Google. But one of the key things that is raised in this book by Loretta Ross is the way in which pretty much 75% of the people in the world may agree with us on something or another. And one of the key features is to learn how to work with people to achieve higher aims 
even if we don't agree with them 100% of the time. There's always a 25% that it's very hard to work with, that it's actually impossible to work with. People who are so rutted in an old school worldview that they're not going to be moved off of that. I have an example of this recently from my own leadership consulting work, which is that I'm coaching someone right now who is working with a supervisor who is a man in his late 60s, early 70s, who is incredibly abrasive and brusque with people on his team. And when he is called on his behavior, his response is, this is just how it's always been in investment banking. You've got to toughen up. That's somebody who perhaps might not be someone you could collaborate with that easily about changing things in a place where you work, okay? But 75% of the people in your community, hopefully, in your workplace are people who you may be able to collaborate with to create change. However, you can't collaborate with people if you don't know how to be persuasive. And one of the things that's so key about this is that this book is really a roadmap for how we can persuade one another and work together. And I will just say, given that equity and inclusion is such a key fundamental part of my work in leadership consulting, it always has been, but right now I feel like it's kind of mandatory work and not from the perspective of we're going to placate a certain group of people inside this company to make them quiet and keep them satisfied, really from the standpoint of understanding that equity and inclusion is the future, that if you are not actually making your workplace and your corporate culture equitable and inclusive, you're going to lose out. You're going to lose out on the bottom line. You're going to lose out on your hiring. You're going to lose out on your retention. Like equity and inclusion is where it is at. And it should be for a whole bunch of reasons. You are not going to be able to build a healthier corporate culture. You're not going to be able to build a company that is truly equitable and inclusive if you can't persuade people to work with you to create that change. So book number four, that every woman leader should be reading this spring, The Persuaders by Anand Giridharis. Brilliant book. If you want to hear more from him, you can go check out my podcast called Living Through It. I interviewed him last fall, right before the book came out. One of my favorite interviews of all time. Okay, final book that I think all women leaders should be reading in the spring of 2023. This is an oldie but goodie, but I got to tell you, this book is just a game changer. It is this book, Atomic Habits. If you are not familiar with this book, this is a book about how to change the way you run your life, your work, everything. And it's really very, very smart. And those of you who have followed me for a long time know that I am not the biggest fan of things like New Year's resolutions, because one of the things that is key to me is that there has to be some form of practical application to goal setting, right? And what happens a lot of times is that we set a goal for something and there really isn't any constructive path to get there. And indeed, one of the things that I work with my clients on all the time is breaking down a big picture goal into incremental steps. How are those increments going to be applied? What's your timetable for those? What are the things that you're going to achieve in the first quarter of 2023, which is almost over? It's shocking. What are the things that you're going to achieve by the middle of the year? And how are these incremental things leading to bigger picture goals? Well, one of the things that's amazing about this book is it talks about the incremental difference that habits make. And in fact, has a whole philosophy about the fact that goal setting really isn't where it's at. Where it's at is developing positive and constructive habits that change your life. So let me just give you an example of this, okay? If you are working to change your mental health perspective, right? You're working perhaps on trauma. You know, this is like an ongoing theme on this channel right now. It's like the issue of trauma therapy because so many of us have trauma in our past. And by the way, reminder, We've all lived through this incredibly traumatic mass event over the last years in the form of the COVID pandemic. We haven't processed that grief. We haven't dealt with the loss of it. We had an enormous amount of trauma resulting from it, whether we lost loved ones or knew people who lost loved ones or lost jobs or had to struggle with our children's mental health. All of these things are traumas that we have not yet processed, okay? So just by way of example, one of the things that you would never expect to do is walk into a therapist's office or into a therapy Zoom meeting and say, this is my goal. My goal is to heal from this trauma and I'm going to do it by tomorrow, right? You would expect instead that there is a process of learning, that there might be psychoeducation that goes with that. There might be exercises that you would engage in with your therapist. There might be session upon session upon session upon session. There might be various sessions of EMDR or various other therapeutic methods that would help you work through that trauma. 
You would never expect to go in and say, this is my goal and I'm gonna crush it in the context of your mental health. Instead, you would wanna do the incremental steps that go in the direction of actually getting it done. What you find though, is that bit by bit and step by step, you start to heal. And then there's one day where you wake up and you're like, wow, suddenly this thing that was occupying so much of my thoughts or this person or this situation that I have been churning about in the middle of the night, one day you wake up and you're like, huh, that's not as intense as it was before. And that's because of the incremental work behind it. It's because you've done the work over time to actually process and heal. So that's one parallel, kind of like an example of what can happen when you actually set habits that you do over and over and over again in incremental ways. Going to therapy once a week is habitual. It's a habit. The other thing I will just say about this book is it talks about how to stack things that we want to achieve from a habit standpoint on top of things that are already working. Those of you who have worked with me one-on-one, -on -one, maybe those of you who have been in some of our programs at the Gaia Leadership Project know that I am all about acknowledging what is working really well so that we can build on it, okay? And if you're not acknowledging what's going well, the other thing that you're doing is not giving yourself the credit that you should be applying to yourself for all the things that you've achieved already that are wonderful and going really well and, and acknowledging how far you've come, which is such a key to like future growth, right? I think one of the things that's really tough for us as women leaders is that because we're told to not tout our own successes, we also then don't acknowledge our own successes even internally. We find it very hard to take praise or acknowledge that we've achieved something through our own hard work or step back for a minute and get the long view perspective about where we are in our lives versus where we were and indeed how far we've come. So this book, Atomic Habits, the author is James Clear and it's called Tiny Changes and Remarkable Results is truly, I think, an integral part of any woman leader's goal setting toolkit for the spring of 2023. All right, that's my video for today. I'm gonna to link all these books below so you can check them out, follow the links, buy the books. Tell me in the comments what you're reading right now because I'm always interested in hearing from folks about what books they've discovered that are propelling their learning forward. And don't forget to smack that subscribe button. It helps me continue this work here and helps to support all of our great work at the Guy Leadership Project. And don't forget to like this video and share it with anyone who may benefit from what we've had to say here, all right? Thanks so much for being here. Take everything that you've learned here and go out into the world with fierce love and make it a better place. And I will see you here next time.